thank you, Daron. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it is really a pleasure and an honor for me to open this evening uh, in honor of the uh, donation to the National Library of Israel of nearly 100 um, notebooks from uh, the mysterious Professor Shoshani, Monsieur Shoshani, um, that odd and enigmatic and brilliant uh, teacher who's about whom we know so little, about whom there are so many stories and legends, and whose influence on great Jewish thinkers of the second half of the 20th century, Elie Wiesel, Emmanuel Levinas, Shalom Rosenberg, um, and others uh, has been profound. And yet there's this enormous gap between uh, the stories, the legends, the influence on the one hand, and, uh, and how little is actually known about this mysterious figure. I'm uh, Dr. Yoel Finkelman. I'm curator of the Judaica collection at the National Library of Israel. Uh, and I am honored to uh, emcee this event. Uh, I wanna begin um, by thanking uh, um, Doron for all his work behind the scenes on the technical level, to Dr. Yael Levy of the National Library of Israel for all of her work putting together these panels. Uh, and I wanna really jump directly into the content, um, but merely to say at the outset that of all the millions and millions of documents of the 100,000 rare books and manuscripts in the National Library of Israel, of the uh, millions of pages of archival documents in our collection, uh, there's something really unique about these uh, notebooks, uh, a sense that we are going to be as a community, as an intellectual community, as an academic community, as a learning community, we're going to be coming back to these materials uh, again and again, we're going to learn from them. We're going to be frustrated by them. We're going to be uh, confused by them. We're not going to be sure how to take the next step. Uh, and yet there's something terribly attractive. One almost can't look away from everything uh, Shoshani related. So uh, we have uh, three speakers this evening. We'll ask each of them to speak for about 20 minutes, after which we will open things up to questions. You can put questions in the chat, and I will uh, help uh, moderate. Uh, and I want to begin by introducing my friend and colleague colleague, Dr. David Lang, um, who is uh, recently completed his uh, PhD in Jewish thought. Um, and, uh, and his particular claim to fame in this context is that he has painstakingly gone through each of these notebooks uh, in order to catalog them and describe them for the ar archival catalog. Uh, at the library. And that makes him perhaps the person on the planet with the closest, most intimate uh, connection with, uh, with this raw material. Uh, and uh, David is going to uh, be introducing us uh, to the work that he's done, uh, not only to describe briefly the contents of these uh, of these notebooks, but also to speak about uh, the creative hermeneutics in Shoshani's thought. So, uh, uh, Dr. Lang, take it away. Thank you. Minute. Yes. Good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm David, and I work at the archive of the National Library. Two years ago, Professor Shalom Rosenberg entrusted dozens of notebooks written by Mr. Shoshani to the National Library. It has been my task to register these notebooks in the web-based catalog of the library. The registration process included naming each of the notebooks and describing each notebook in brief terms. I've spent many months reading, reading through these materials to provide an initial description of the content of each notebook. This description is meant to assist those, interest, those interested in learning about Mr. Shoshani's thought. Six months ago, in October 2021, the National Library held an event about Mr. Shoshani in Hebrew. A video of this event is now available on YouTube. During the October event, I gave a talk in which I suggested a classification of the content of the notebooks. My suggested classification included six categories, three main categories and three, and three additional ones. Uh, the three main categories 
are Jewish scholarship, sciences, and other interests. The three additional categories are personal and biographical material, tables of letters and numbers, and philosophy. I would like to provide a very brief overview of these categories. Before us, before us are the six categories arranged in a table. The three at the top of the table are the main categories, and the three at the bottom are the additional ones. I will now fill in the table with the subtitles included in each category. These contents appear in the, appear in the notebooks and are related to the three main categories. Jewish scholarship. Mr. Shoshani deals with all Jewish subjects, including the Bible, the Talmud, Halakha, and Kabbalah, as well as topics such as punctuation. In the sciences, Mr. Shoshani concentrates on mathematics, physics, and astronomy. His examination of these fields is in is an integral part of this worldview and is a requirement, requirement for a complete form of wisdom. Other fields of interest include history, life sciences and natural sciences like biology, medicine and geology. Under this category, we also see topics of interest that Mr. Shoshani finds entertaining, such as the Bible contest held in Jerusalem in 1958. Mr. Shoshani made a note for himself, questions and answers from the contest and, and the names of the participants. He listened to the contest on the radio. Each of the contents that appear in each category has details and examples. I show this in, in that lecture in Hebrew, and hopefully I will give the same talk again in English on another occasion. These are contents that appear in, in notebooks and, and are related to the three other categories. Biographical materials. There is not much biographical materials in the notebooks. From time to time, the notebooks feature the names of people whom Shushani met in different places in Israel, France, and Montevideo. Phones and addresses, price, prices and costs of house rental, etc. The next category is tables of letters and numbers. These are probably calculations relating to the Jewish calendar, such as when one beings to see the moon, meaning the molad, in different years. Such tables can fill several consecutive pages in, no, in a notebook. The last category is philosophy. The philosophical commentary is based on Mr. Shoshani, Mr. Shoshani's interpretation of the entire Jewish library. Mr. Shoshani's thought is concerned with methods of interpretation. It teaches how to interpret, especially the Bible and the Talmud. He gives tools, methods, and of course, a great many examples of his interpretations. He likes to engage in instruction of wisdom and morals, especially in the book of Proverbs, Mishlei, and Psalms, Tehilim. It all ultimately leads to spiritual aspiration of humility and holiness. Thus far, I have given a concise repetition of the lecture I have already given in Hebrew. In recent months, a website has been created where scans of dozens of Mr. Shoshani's notebooks are now available. Now anyone can view and read the notebooks. The notebooks. After the site was placed online, I was contacted by some people who have been asking me um, additional questions about Mr. Shoshani, Mr. Shoshani and his world. 
The questions about Mr. Shoshani, personality, identity, behavior, mentality, and religiosity are all questions that historians and psychologists can deal with, and perhaps they will be able to find answers from the materials in the notebooks as well. In recent months, several leading researchers have approached me with questions after viewing the notebooks online. There were two main questions asked. Are Mr. Shoshani's ideas original? And is it worth spending the time to decipher the, the writings in other words? Is the content worth the effort? Another question I'm asked is whether Mr. Shoshani has a cohesive and value-oriented philosophy. I will try to address these questions with an example. Before the example, I want to mention that although the site does not belong to the National Library, the notebooks appear on the site with the official archival numbering, 1CH1, 1CH2, 1CH3, etc. This numbering will now be the official marking of the notebooks for future reference. So I would like to give an example from a paragraph that appears at the end of the second page of notebook 1CH15. This is the page, and this is the paragraph that is now marked. The first word in the paragraph is probably pnima, meaning inward. I will not address this word now. The three words now marked in the paragraph are ba'aretz, meaning in the land, shabbat, and ubashmita, meaning in the seventh day, in the seventh year. There, there are, these are the key words in the paragraph. In this short paragraph, in his laconic style, Mr. Shoshani makes a kind of comparison between the mitzvah of Shabbat and the mitzvah of Shemitah, including a reference to the Eved, Ama, Behema, and Ger, meaning slave, maid, cattle, and stranger. Uh, the very scholarly comparison between the commandment of Shabbat and the commandment of Shemitah is of course apparent, and there is no innovation in it per se. After all, the Shvita, resting period is done on the seventh day, Shabbat, and is done in the seventh year, Shemitah. The Torah itself describes the Shemitah by using the word Shabbat. It can be said that the Torah invites the scholars to interpret through the tools of commentary based on com comparison between the scriptures in the two commandments. Of the four lines in, paragraph, in the paragraph, I want to read with you a line and a half that has an interesting, bold, unconventional commentary that is ahead of its time. Let's start with the three words in the end. This is the line and a half. Let's start with the three words at the end of the first line of the paragraph, marked here. Ishtecha chaser b'shabbat. Your wife is missing on Shabbat. This statement refers to the verse which is said in the Kiddush of Shabbat. This is the verse from the Ten Commandments in which the instruction of the Shabbat appears. In this verse, there are couples. Um, your son and daughter, your servant and your maid, your maid, male and female, male and, male and female, but the verse opens the list of persons commanded not to do a craft by the Hebrew word ata, meaning you, which ostensibly means only the adult male, the father of the son and daughter, the owner of the slave and maid, and the maid. Allow me to clarify. The reference to the word you in English refers to male and female. In Hebrew, there is a division between male and female. The word atar refers 
to a male, and the word at refers to a female. We translate the word ata into the word you, but we must remember that normally in Hebrew, it refers only to men. By using the word ata without mention the word at or the word ishtecha, the adult female, the mother, is seemingly missing. Ostensibly, for the sake of the uniformity of the, of the biblical formulation that details the male and female in the verse, your son and daughter, your servant and your maid, you and your wife should have written. Apparently, there is a discrimination here. Discrimination here of the mother's status of the adult woman. Seemingly, there is here a disregard, omission, and neglect. Mr. Shoshani is sensitive to the lack of mention of the woman, sensitive to her absence. He writes, your wife is missing on Shabbat. Ishtecha chaser be Shabbat. But notice that here, surprisingly, in the following words, he teaches a completely opposite understanding of the lack of mention of the woman. He writes in the following words now marked, meaning, hence we see a complete equality between a man and a, and a woman. Moreover, hence we can learn about a complete equality between a man and a woman. How does the absence of the woman indicate complete equality? On the face of it, as we explained, it seems exactly the opposite. On the face of it, the Torah seems to address only you, the male, the man, Ata. Where is the complete equality between a man and a woman? And more than that, how can this equality, this complete equality be learned from here? from your wife's absence of Shabbat. Mr. Shoshani provides the answer immediately below. First of all, he states in the following words now marked, Zayn Vav Nun, meaning Zachar Venekeva, equal Ata, equal Ledor Mekablei HaTorah, meaning male and female equal you, equal to the generation of the recipients of the Torah. Mr. Shoshani says here that Ata in the Torah is male and female. This is how the, gener the generation of Torah recipients naturally understood this. This is a statement that may sound either as a detached naivety or as an intellectual, cultural, religious, and scholarly revelation. From an academic point of view, simply for scholars, that the cultural situation in biblical times was masculine and patriarchal, and therefore the world Torah addresses the man, the father, the adult male, from a religious orthodox point of view. There is a clear distinction between women's and men's commitment to the commandments. This, this perception is is certainly based on the reference in the word Ata in most Torah commandments. On what does Mr. Shoshani base his statement that the word Ata in the Torah refers to both male and female? Let's see in his words, in the following words now marked. Vehem yashgichu al ben bat eved ama behema vager, parentheses, ein hevdel zachar venekeva beger, כבר בעתה, ראש וסוף, זכר ונקבה, במילה אחת. Meaning, and they will look after son, daughter, slave, maid, cattle, and stranger. There is no uh, parenthesis, there is no difference between male and female in the word girl, stranger. We see that the word אתה, that the word אתה, this is also that in the word Ata, this is also the case. The word in the beginning and the end of the verse refer to male and female in the same word. Mr. Shoshani starts with ref referencing the, cl the classical Torah commentators, Rashi, Ramban, and Ibn Ezra, 
these scholars asked why the Torah details both female and male, son and daughter, instead of just saying your children, as the Torah is known for its laconic wording. In every case where we see a more detailed approach, we must ask why the Torah provides such detail. The classic commentary on the Torah, on the Torah explains that the detailing provided in this case is meant to emphasize the duties of the parents. Shoshani summarizes this commentary by writing, they will look after them. Vehem yashgichu al. Now, Mr. Shoshani comes back to his statement, referring to Ata in the Torah as being both male and female. This is done in parentheses. אין הבדל, זכר ונקבה בגר, כבר בעתה, ראש וסוף, זכר ונקבה במילה אחת. There is no difference between male and female in the word girl, stranger. We see that in the word עתה, this is also the case, the word in the beginning and the end of the, of the verse refer to male and female in the same word. Mr. Shoshani operates a commentary method that is reminiscent of the commentary of the Tanaim. In the verse about Shabbat, the word Ata appears as the first in the list without distinction between male and female. Without distinction. At the end of the list, the word girl also refers to an adult male. The details, the, the detail of male and female occurs only in the figures in the middle, son and daughter who are male and female, and slave and maid who are male and female. Mr. Shoshani acts as a commentator at the level of the Tanaim and states, and states that out of this formulation in which at the beginning and end only the male appears without breakdown of male and female, while in the middle, the breakdown into male and female appears, from this formulation, we learn that the statement girl and ata both include male and female. Male and female, male and female equal you, equal to the generation of the recipients of the Torah. Zachar v'nekeva shaveh ata, shaveh ledor mekableh Torah. I will now add another idea which I learned from Professor Kosman, who will speak after me. The, the, gener the generation of the recipients of the Torah is not a chronological state, but a state of consciousness, a state of mind. He who hears the word of God has no question at all whether the reference of the Torah in the word Ata is directed only to the adult male or also to the adult female. It is clear to him that Ata is addressed to both male and female because the criterion for hearing God's voice is not gender but purity of heart. The word of God comes to one whose heart is pure enough to hear God's word. In another words, equality between men and women. To conclude, the interpretation that appears in Mr. Shoshani's writings that we have now learned about, uh, about the verse of the Shabbat command, commandment, I do not know from another source, but it may be that Mr. Shoshani picked it up from a book or an article he read or heard it from a teacher or rabbi with whom he studied. In any case, Mr. Shoshani incorporated this wonderful innovation in his sermon on Shabbat and Shemitah and the relationship between them to the concept that all the commandments depend on being in the land of Israel. The novelty according to which Ata in the Torah refers to male and female is advanced religious openness that includes gender equality in the Jewish worship of God based on creativity and an 
uncompromising scholarly reading of the Torah. I want to end with the following remarks. Does Mr. Shoshani have a cohesive and value-oriented philosophy? I will try to mention two or three terms representing his mode of thinking. As I said initially, central terms in Mr. Shoshani's thought are commentary, wisdom, and morality. Mr. Shoshani, as we see in his writings, give great importance to refraining from unethical actions. His, co his concern in these matters was the potential for spiritual and moral decline due to unethical behavior or ignorance. Mr. Shoshani turns to the Bible, particularly Proverbs, Mishlei, and Psalms, Tehilim, for ethical and spiritual guidance. Mr. Shoshani identifies various references in the Bible and the Talmud to multiple personality types and patterns of human mentality. Using his phenomenal memory, he organizes these references and makes comparisons between them to understand, to understand how the Bible and the Talmud relate to each of these personality types. In doing so, Mr. Shoshani conducts discussions and comparisons between different types of students, teachers, the righteous and the wicked. His goal is to identify, is, is to identify and refine the description of the proper behavior. In his upcoming lecture, Professor Kosman will teach us about one of the ethical and spiritual principles present in the writings of Mr. Shoshani. I want to thank all of you for your time. And finally, I would like to thank my daughter, Shir, for preparing the PowerPoint presentation. Good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lang, and thank you also to Shear for her work on the PowerPoint. Um, and if, if anything we've learned from that is just how much we have to give of ourselves in our efforts to unpack this. A line and a half of text in short uh, abbreviations and obscure symbols with references to that many biblical verses uh, and, and Talmudic ideas hinting at broader philosophical and theological questions of gender and Judaism, uh, all in about a line and a half of text, tells us what we're up against in, in our work unpacking this. Uh, I want to uh, call in Professor Admiel Kosman. Uh, he's the pro a professor of religious and Jewish studies at Potsdam University in Berlin and the academic director of the Abraham Geiger Rabbinical Seminary there. He holds a PhD from the Talmud Department of Bar Ilan University, uh, as well as a background in, uh, in, in art from the Bezalel Art Com uh, Academy. He uh, continues to write for uh, Israel's leading newspaper, Haaretz, and is also uh, has been granted several literary prizes, including the Bernstein Prize and the Brenner Prize. And uh, Professor Kosman will speak about the tension between the path of the Jew to God and the path of every human being to God in the teachings of Monsieur Shoshani. Hey, uh, shalom to everybody. Thank you, uh, Yoel. Can, can you hear me well? It's okay? Okay, thank you. And thank you, David. Thank you, uh, uh, Yoel and Ron, for the help. Uh, my, my talk will start with um, uh, personal memories because I, I knew about Shoshani much before I think anybody in the world have known about it because he was uh, uh, visiting our uh, family at home in Haifa when he was in Israel. Uh, I heard from uh, Michael Grinspan, who is expert in the field of, uh, of uh, Shoshani and his life and prepared a, 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 a film that will probably will be uh, in public uh, uh, in several months, uh, that in 52, he immigrated from France to Israel. Levinas was very sad when he had no connection anymore with him because he disappeared with no note suddenly from uh, Paris. And when he was in Haifa, in Israel, 
He uh, visited my grandmother, grandfather in Haifa, in Abbas. The, the, in the beginning, they lived there. And he, as I was a child, as a child, when I went to, with my father to the synagogue in Shabbat, usually he spoke about uh, Shoshani many times and told me stories. I, I, heard, I heard the name Shoshani from him as a child, five years old, I think. And then many stories came on the way that my father would, for example, how, how he jumped from the window or behaves very strangely and how he and his uh, brother, uh, who is a rabbi, uh, nowadays he, um, followed him in the streets with his suitcase. Now I know what was in the suitcase, what David now is trying to, to work on, on it. And um, this was quite frequent. They, uh, he, he, he learned with my grandfather at home after they ate uh, the meal. And uh, I wouldn't go into the personal stories because there are dozens of stories that were left in our family about him. I would tell you, only one thing that is important for me now. Uh, the story, how they departed from each other with a big quarrel and uh, had no connection anymore. Uh, probably it was uh, nearly the time that he was before uh, immigrating to South America. The story that I've heard and did not understand at that time, what is the meaning is that they reached a point in the Talmud, probably Sanhedrin or Sota, speaking about Jesus, Yeshu. And uh, my grandfather was a strict Haredic ultra-Orthodox person. And uh, probably uh, Shoshani said good things about uh, Jesus. Things that are, uh, were so, um, my grandfather became so angry that he started shouting at him and then he disappeared and ha they had no connection anymore. <laughs> so this story is a personal story that I remember from my childhood. And I, now I understand it better. The, the tension between the universalist and the particularist was, was the reason for this fight. But uh, I will share the screen in order to explain something that later on, I didn't know about the, when I was five years old about Levinas at all. But later on, I could, found, I could find the interesting connection to that teacher of Levinas and what had happened with my grandfather. Uh, I'll share the screen and show you something uh, that is important for uh, explaining something here on, on uh, I hope that I can share the screen if it's okay, Doron. Um, just a second. Yes, this is the text. No, this is not the text, sorry. Sorry. This is not the right, not the right one. Just a second. Yes, here is the text of Levinas, uh, one of them that I wanted to bring into this discussion. It's from nine Talmudic readings. Levinas says about Shoshani, he is he's not mentioning the name, but it's obviously Shoshani. He says he's discussing, I, I don't have now to talk about, to explain the whole discussion, but the Talmud is mentioning the sons of Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov. Uh, and immediately Levinas says, but do not become alarmed. Immediate, immediately you can jump from your chair. We are not in a presence of a racist idea here, that only those who are the chosen people, the sons of Abraham, Tzach, and Yaakov, don't, don't be <laughs> alarmed. I have it from an eminent master. Now, what did he have from an eminent master? What did Shoshani taught Levinas, which became now universal? Each time Israel is mentioned in the Talmud, one is certainly free to understand by it a particular ethnic group, which is, sorry, I, I read it to, to uh, each time Israel is mentioned in the Talmud, one is certainly free to understand by it a particular ethnic group, which is probably fulfilling an incomparable destiny. But to interpret it in this manner would be to reduce the general principle in the idea enunciated in the Talmudic passage to forget that Israel means a people who has received the law and as a result, a human nature which has reached the fullness of its responsibilities and its self-consciousness. The descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak and Jacob are human beings who are no longer 
childlike. When I read it later on, when I was able to read Levinas, and I read this sentence, I, it was like a you know, blow in the face for me, because I learned in many yeshivot, and for me, it always was bothering, this, this uh, uh, tension between particular and universal. And suddenly you see somebody who is defining Israel whenever the Talmud says, Levinas, in the name of Shoshani, whenever the Talmud says Israel, it has nothing to do with particular nation that is called Jew, Jewish people. It is everybody who is mature enough to take responsibility in the world and be responsibility in the mor moral way to other people. Who, he is Israel. Now I'll try to explain it uh, because it sounds very strange, from the text nowadays especially, uh, uh, from the text of Shoshani itself and, and give it more light from what I um, have seen in the text. Now, I, I have to thank uh, uh, David, David uh, Dr. David Lang for the help that he gave me in the, because I'm not, I'm not into this, uh, of course, uh, uh, booklets and I cannot say anything about it. I got the text from David and uh, one text will be, here uh, presented from the collection of uh, Michael Greenspan, in, uh, which is very important later. Now, let's see that first text, and I have to tell you that I worked a lot in order to understand what's going on here, as you see. And this is quite, quite easy text uh, comparing to the others. I put here a kind of a, a, a translation, let's call it, or rewriting it in, in, a, in, a, in a way that everybody can follow me. And for those who are not mastering the Hebrew, I'll translate it. Um, now he says like that, ki higdiru, can you see here in the text, ki higdiru? Ki higdiru mi Yehudi. The Talmud is defining who is a Jew. In one, you see, this is, I'm not inventing it, it's written here. Kol hakofer be'avodah zara, is a Jew. Everybody who is not accepting idolatry is a Jew. Now, I think that there is much more to speak about what is the one who is a kofer, is heretic. Now, not accepting Avodah Zarah, not accepting or denying or, or fighting with Avodah Zarah, which is, as you have seen in the text of David, there is much more uh, deep level to the statement as it is said so shortly here. Lo uh, amru, what, what comes with barricades is my addition, just to explain. Lo amru she, shirak yahadut bo. The rabbis did not say that he is, should be Jewish. Ela she'af nikra yehudi. Not only that he is yahadut bo, Jewishness is in him, he is called Jewish. Chaver la'am aze, a friend, member, better to say, in this nation. Shekol tafkido, what is the destiny of these people? Lilachem ve'avodah zara. To fight with the phenomenon of avodah zara, of idolatry. But now he, he, he is playing with the word. Banechar, and he explains, chutz le'yehuda. Yehuda, yehudi, what is, what is foreign? Nechar is foreign to the Yehuda, what is foreign to Yehuda. This is Jewish. Jew, the Jews are fighting in what is foreign to Yehuda. Lefi Pirush Chazal, he himself put the exclamation mark. Lefi Pirush Chazal, yes? <laughs> See it here, Lefi Pirush Chazal, with ex exclamation mark, yes? He says, he, he is wondering, he, he is, full of awe to Chazal when he is speaking about it to the rabbis. Lo hisesu, did not have any, any a moment of, of hesitation, hisesu, lehases, hesitation, velo darshu ol malchut shamayim, he writes it with the abbreviation. They did not demand from a Jew to have all malchut shamayim, to, to accept on himself the, the, the kingdom of God. The, וכן היה בהיסטוריית בית ראשון. This was the case in בית ראשון. They did not demand anything from those who wanted to join the people of the Jews. 
know uh, the whole co uh, the whole process of con con uh, converting as it is now we, we know he says it is from Bait Sheni it's from the rabbis later in Bait Rishon they did not demand anything the history of Bait Rishon and he gives now exp exp uh, examples that are quite shocking Shlomo Shenasa Nochriot Shlomo have been married to non-Jewish women and in, according to Shoshani there was no conversion because Rambam is writing The, don't worry, he converted all these women. While he says no, they just accept on themselves to be Jews, which means no Avodah Zarah. We know that some of them <laughs> worshipped our idols later, and that was the reason for, for things that happened later. And, and God, of course, uh, uh, speaks in the Bible uh, against what, what Shlomo Dan have done. But the conversion as a process, halachic one, was not existing. Or Paverut, He gives the another example, or Paverut, from the Megillah of Ruth. Acheret lo aita mafzeret ban shetachzorna, ve'amech ami Eloheich Elohei. They just accept the God of Israel, and that's all. No conversion as a process. Lo nizkar shetavla, there was no mikveh, and nobody uh, demand from, from, from uh, Giyoret, the one who, uh, female, who is converting to go to the mikveh as a process, because there was nothing. And this is a, a shocking, he himself is putting an exclamation mark, wondering about it, yes? He says that the rabbis were daring uh, to, I mean, Judaism was daring and, and understood what does it mean to be a Jew. Now, let me explain something important when I go to the Avodah Zarah. The text I brought here is shortly, for those who know the Talmud, I say it shortly. The Talmud many times, is regarding to Avodah Zarah, to idolatry, as an inner process, as something that you have to get rid of. For example, the Talmud uh, is, is the, uh, mm, mm, saying that the one who is angry as a type of person is in his own way, he's worshiping idolatry. So the, this is something inner, not so much about the outer, and we have to understand it because in, Uh, you, I'll explain something, you would wonder, and I will try to prove that I'm right, just a second. For, for Shoshani, and later on for Levinas, the center of worshiping God is working on removing a curtain. What is the curtain that uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, making the way to God for us so difficult to be devoted to God? What is the whole point of religious life, it is the egocentric center. We are egocentric, the ego is standing there, and this is the Avodah Zarah, that one who wants to be devoted to God have to remove. We cannot do it, it's not easy, we have to have the grace of God, but this is the direction. Now Avodah Zarah for him is this point. Now, as I said, you wonder how do I know it? From Levinas, maybe you know it, but what's it called, egology. But how do we know it from Shoshani? Here is a text that David, in his grace, supplied to me, and, and I can show it to you. <laughs> Very difficult text. Again, I had to work a lot with David in order to understand what's going on here. But see the point. Lishmoa, he says, and don't ask me now to show it in the text. You have to, if you want, I can send you the PDF. Lishmoa. Mishmat. Mishmat is discipline. You have to work. Lishmoa, the words of God that you have to listen to. Shma Israel, hear Israel, means discipline, working. But here is the whole point. The tension that we spoke before is one of the tensions, the universalism, particularism. Now I speak about another tension between being uh, uh, passive and being active, which is something that was is in, in interesting and, and Shoshani spend probably time of understanding it deeply. Lishmoa mishmat, mishmat discipline. discipline. Discipline is to be active. Learchiv ofek yediot. This is the words of, of Shoshani. To expand your horizons of knowledge. And as we know, he was expanding his knowledge anywhere that he could expand. In any, any, anything that comes from any wisdom that he could reach. Ladat, to know, ech la'asot. 
why knowledge? Not because you want to be arrogant and be a professor and show off your knowledge. This is not worth even one penny. This is worth nothing for Shoshani. The whole point is that the knowledge will bring you somewhere in, in your inner life, ladat ech laasot, how to behave, how to do, how to behave, to change yourself to be another person, as I said, and now I'll try to show you, to be as much as you can closer to God means to be as much as you can with no ego, no egocentric center, no personality, personality in the sense that people know personality in the street. Vehakol, everything that comes to you, al yede passiviyut. Although you are commanded in the mitzvot, and you do, and you make your own efforts to study and change yourself, in the end, everything is grace. Akol ha'yede passiviyut. Everything is, is, is not by act your activism, but, but, but you're reducing yourself to such a lower, a humble person that you can accept. Because the Talmud is speaking about it and I'm sure that uh, Shoshani knows it and I'm sure that in the booklets you can find it somewhere, that real wisdom goes always down. Not too hard, like water says the Talmud in Tanit. Real wisdom like water are, cannot climb up. They all go, water, water go down, waters go down. When you are humble, the grace of the wisdom can come to you because you are humble. The akol al yedeh passiviyut gmura, total passivity. Bitul enochiyut. If you ask where he is writing it here, bitul enochiyut, bitul ego, canceling the ego, canceling the egocentrism. Shem ze, then when you are canceling your ego, mevi, ze mevi leruach hakodesh. That brings the Holy Spirit to dwell in your life. Anav Mikol, now he's bringing, obviously, Moses. Anav Mikol Adam, uh, as I say, is written in Numbers, Bamidbar, who was the most humble person on earth, Moses, Moshe. Lo kam kamoto la'asaga. Here is the connection between knowledge and humility. Meek life, as in the, in the Christian like to say. Meekness. When you are humble, you are uh, able to open the wisdom to come to you. When you are arrogant, then real wisdom would not come to you. You might be encyclopedia, but that's not the point. The whole point is to open yourself to real wisdom. And therefore Moses is the example. Nobody could get this wisdom that Moses had. Says Shoshani, Asta, Anava, Kevle Suliata. This is from Avod Rabbi Natan and from other places, Yerushalmi and so on. Namely, what the wisdom made as a wisdom in the sense that people know, I know, is, is crown on the head, is just the hills in the hills of Anava. Uh, again, I, I hope that you can follow me, but this is not so important. I, I can go on because I have only 20 minutes, so I'll try to be short. Now, um, uh, uh, how much time I have? I, I would like to consider how, uh, how, how much I have to jump, uh, Yoel. Can you help um, me? A few more minutes, a minute a or few two. More minutes. So I'll jump on all what I prepared here. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, surely would have another uh, uh, option to speak about it so I can jump on it. The whole point now, if you understand that religious life, means for Shoshani, and later on Levinas understood it in his moral teaching, obviously, uh, developed it in the Western uh, phenomenology and so on. The whole idea is being humble in front of God. But now, now we are coming to the point that uh, this text I got from Michael, and he uh, also the one who wrote to me what is written here because it's very, very difficult. But the explanation would come, as I understand it, from the very, very short and dense, dense text of, of, uh, of um, Shoshani here. Abbreviation, Tzadik She'eno Gamur, Tzadik She'eno Gamur, 
Yes, you can see Tzadik Sheino Gamur. <laughs> that's the beginning, Tzadik Sheino Gamur. Namely, the one who is not really fully righteous person. The Talmud is speaking about the difference between the two types of people. Tzadik Gamur means the one who is fully righteous person, 100%, and the Tzadik Sheino Gamur is the one who is on, a, uh, on the way, on the way. Now, the, the discussion of, of uh, Shoshani here, I also try to translate it because it's so difficult, but since I have only a few minutes, I wouldn't steal the time from Miriam that is going to speak uh, uh, later after me. So I'll, I'll do it in a very short way to explain. He, uh, Shoshani, uh, in a very short and, 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 and really hard to understand way, explained to us the difference in what we call pro proverb, proverbs, no, no, providence, sorry, providence in English, namely Ashgacha. And in a way, it is written in, in, in Rambam and he's not mentioning it, but uh, Moren Evochim, uh, the guide of the purpose, is saying it in this way or the other. He says that the one who is getting the providence of God and knows that nothing can happen to him if he is following his path toward God and never have to be afraid of anything in life, is the one who is fully righteous person. All the others, he says, Sugav Rabim, all the others, Tzadik Sheno Gamor, all the others are on the way. In, and there are many, many different types. Those who are really in shiflut and meekness, and uh, Dash Ba'akevav is referring to the last statement that I don't want now to explain because I have no time. What is the difference between the two types? This is extremely important point. He says in a very short way, the one who still have in his heart envy is not fully righteous person. Fully righteous person, perfect righteous person is the one who is getting greed totally, of course, by grace of God, from any envy in his inner life. Mekane, <laughs> this is a statement from the Talmud that I don't have time to explain. Those who still have envy in their heart are never protected. Those who got rid totally from envy and they are giving up totally on any achievement outside, namely the authentic center, then the wisdom come to them. And then they are in a kind of providence from God that they never have to be fear any to have any fear from anything in life. They are having hashgacha pratit, private providence. Whatever they need will come to them. Think about Shoshani, <laughs> about the risk it, that he took in the time of the Nazis, and he still st st was wandering in everywhere in France with no fear. That's a story that I heard from my father, from my grandfather, and and others are talking about it endlessly. Yes, Eli Wiesel and the others. This type of a person who has no fear is because he knows that God is with him everywhere because he is fully righteous person, perfect person. Then uh, as much as you are closer to this degree, to, to this rank or, or level, better to say, of getting greed of the center that we call egocentric center, then you are feeling secure everywhere, every moment. You know that God will be with you because whatever you do is not you <laughs> that is doing it. It is done via yourself. But I have to stop here. And, and sorry, I cannot really fully explain the beautiful text of uh, Shoshani here. I have to make a stop here and give the time. Sorry. Give the time to... Uh, to Sorry, uh, uh, somebody is the interfering me. I'll, I'll stop it in the, in the computer. You can go on and I'll shut off the, the computer. Probably it's my son, sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kosman, giving us another hint into a couple of, uh, of ideas and creativity in, in Monsieur Shoshani's thought, particularly the way in which he seems to be searching for inclusive and more universalistic readings that tie into the comments that David discussed regarding uh, including women looking for opportunities to make things more inclusive and universalist. 
um, which is certainly a, a theme to look out for as we keep making our way through these notebooks. Um, I want to ask Miriam uh, Camarini to be our third speaker for this evening. Uh, she is a theater director, writer, singer, actress, uh, who does extremely creative work of interpretation as, uh, as in her work as an artist. Uh, and she is the founder and artistic director of Benash Mashot, the Jewish theater in Milan. Uh, and among her long resume of accomplishments is uh, creative and artistic work uh, that has been molded around uh, and inspired by uh, um, Mr. Shoshani. Hi, thank you. I'm extremely honored to be part of this panel. It's really a great, great honor, and it was a pleasure to listen to Professor Long and Professor Kosman. Um, thank you for this invite. Um, what I will do is slightly different um, because I, I'm going to talk about my work on Monsieur Shoshani um, as an artist. Um, so I will be mostly talking about the work of art and theater I tried doing on uh, this character over the years. So uh, my brief talk will be different than the ones that uh, came earlier because I will not be able <laughs> to um, add much knowledge and much interpretation on Shoshani per se, but it will be something a little different as in what can be done with this character in a, a theatrical or artistic form in general. So it, it is an exercise of storytelling, which I've been doing. Um, <clears throat> I would love to begin by um, uh, telling a little bit about um, the, the, my encounter, I guess, with Shushani. Um, I'm right now just trying to show you um, an article that was published by the Italian Jewish newspaper Pagine Ebraiche, Jewish Pages or Hebrew Pages. This is an issue from June 2014, and it was one of the first articles I published about him. Uh, it was in the cultural section of this, uh, which is the Italian Jewish paper. Um, so um, in, in this article, I was telling how I came to the first nine years of work about Shushani. Um, and basically what happened is that uh, to step another 10 years earlier in uh, um, the spring of 2005, around Pesach of 2005, I was a theater student at the State University of Milan and I was working with uh, the university company, which included Jewish and non-Jewish actors and musicians. And we were working on the staging. It was my very first production as a director um, of Elie Wiesel's The Trial of God. It's the only play that uh, Elie Wiesel wrote as a play. Um, it's a Purim spiel. It happens during the pogroms of Khmelnytsky in the 17th century. Um, and I was basically researching and reading everything I could find I could find about Elie Wiesel. Uh, we had this show that was supposed to open in September of 2005 and it was um, produced by the Jewish community of Milan and the European Day of Jewish Culture and a festival called Mittelfest in uh, northern eastern Italy. So it was a relatively big event for a student production. Um, so I was reading pretty much everything I could about Elie Wiesel. Um, and I remember that while reading his uh, memoir, um, All the Rivers Flow to the Sea, I was completely captured and fascinated by this character of Shushani, whom I've never heard uh, about before. Um, and as I was really in the midst of this, uh, uh, you know, very deep artistic work on uh, theodicy and God's justice and the whole um, topic of Elie Wiesel's The Trial of God, uh, which as you already can understand from the title is a trial to God that happens on Purim, which also happens to be the day in which I was born. So many things were unfolding and folding one into the other. I kept having dreams about this mysterious character Shushani. So I went from zero to 100, as in until the day before I'd never heard his name even. Um, and then all of a sudden, this person was visiting my dreams. I was 21, so I believe that is an age in which a person is very easily um, impressed and influenced by what they read. Um, so my work on Elie Wiesel's play went together with 
a deeper and deeper and deeper fascination for Shushani. So I was trying to find other texts that Wiesel wrote about him. And at the same time, I was having some conversations with a friend of my parents, a person who used to teach in the shul we went to in Milan, where I grew up and where I was at the time. Um, and this person is called Chaim Baharyev. Um, and I remember that one of my conversations with him, I mentioned um, this character, Shushani, whom I just read about. And Chaim looks at me and says, oh, so you know. And I said, you know what? <laughs> and he said, you know that I've met him. Um, and he started telling me how he met uh, when he was a young, very, very young kid. Um, and he started telling me that Shushani was a regular guest at his uh, parents uh, in Paris and he used to learn with his father and he was eating at their table. And then Chaim shared with me a few of the stories that then later I would hear from other people or I would read from other people the whole stories um, that we know about the suitcase that was left with someone and the suitcase that was, not, was then opened uh, just to find uh, a silverware that had been stolen from the house in which it was stored and you know all the stories that I think many of us have since then read and heard about but for me this was completely new um, and also in Italy in Milan in those years again we're talking about the early 2000s there was no one else who had heard about this person and no one I could you know share conversations so I was the one announcing about Shushani in a way together with um, the facts from life that Chaim Baharia would share with me and with his students at the time uh, but this was completely new at the time and really there wasn't um, there wasn't a lot of information about. So I started reading uh, in uh, Elie Wiesel. Um, and then I remember one thing that uh, Chaim Bacharier said to me, um, which was his opinion. He said that he thought that Shushani was mostly a collective hallucination, something that um, European Jewry who had come out destroyed and traumatized and murdered by World War II needed some, something like a collective dream, a collective hallucination uh, to redeem itself, to um, restore life and faith and uh, some power and strength. So in his um, words, those days, because since then he has been saying different things, but in those days what he told me was that um, he believed Shushani had been an hallucination. He's also a psychoanalyst. Um, um, and it was a, a, the hero that the Jewish people needed uh, in those days, right after World War II. It wasn't a hero of strength and force and power and violence. It was a hero of knowledge. Um, and a few years later, I remember I heard something, a theologian that was talking in the Italian radio, um, who mentioned something very, very similar referred to Daniel, the prophet. Um, in the Tanakh, in the Bible, um, he gave a whole interpretation of the Jewish people losing the land and going into the first exile in uh, Babylon, in Babel, um, and gaining intellect and wisdom and uh, uh, knowledge. And in that case, Daniel, you know, this um, wunderkind, this prodigious child who knew everything and was as intelligent and clever as the adults and could, you know, help adults uh, making judgment was in a way the, the, the tumura, what um, the Jewish people obtained in exchange as a payback for exile. You lose the land, but you gain knowledge. So this idea fascinated me very much. And in those years, in the year 2008, nine, I started with the same theater company to work on another character that I was deeply intrigued by, which was the myth and the legend of the golem. So in a way, in those years, and at the time I had already moved to Jerusalem uh, to continue my studies, both in uh, Talmud and uh, in Tanakh at Pardes, and then I started um, studying um, at Hebrew U, again, theater. Um, so in those years, I was very much fascinated by um, the legend of the golem of the golem of Prague and all the Polish uh, golems. And I was reading a lot about um, about this other kind of uh, hero and messiah and uh, the messiah Ben Joseph. So the 
temporary messiah, a messiah of the fist, as it's called. And I was reading about the Habima production of the golem in the um, 1920s. So in a way, in my own artistic world, these two characters, the golem and Shushani, became uh, brothers, <laughs> twins, but also twins like uh, Yaakov and Esav, in a way, uh, opposite twins. One was the hero of violence and physical strength, and the other was the wandering um, um, hero, the one that was not bound to any land, that was an eternal wanderer. Um, and I remember in those early years, I also went and interviewed Professor Shalom Rosenberg, and I asked him what he thought about um, this whole mythological approach to Shushani being this collective hallucination and the hero of the diaspora. And he told me, maybe this was true in Europe, uh, the Shushani that I've known down there in a uh, uh, in uh, Uruguay and in, in South America was a real character. I even felt his weight. And by that, I understood later that he meant that Shushani had really died on his own shoulders um, when they were together in Montevideo in 1968. But this is a story that I would have discovered and read more about later. So in those years, this, this was pretty much where I stood. Um, and then what happened is that I moved away from Jerusalem. I went to Berlin for a few months, and uh, there I met Professor Kosman, who spoke before me um, today. So we met at uh, Limud, uh, Limud Deutschland, Limud Berlin, I believe. And I remember that he was teaching a shiur, he was teaching a session at uh, Limud uh, Berlin one Sunday afternoon on uh, a passage from the, from the Babylonian Talmud, from the Gemara, talking about Chonya Me'agel, that's another mythological figure who draws a circle and begs God for rain and talks to God in a very um, childish, in a way, way, in a very homey way. Um, and at some point, Professor Kosman uh, uh, quoted Shushani, said something bediavad en passant about Shushani. And I just remember um, the uh, glances exchange that went on in the room as soon as he as he mentioned Shushani, there was this feeling of some people belong to this club, some people know what we're talking about, and some people don't. And it was very clear to me at that point, and this is something that I've quite recently read uh, from uh, Professor Shalom Rosenberg, that the world is divided between the people who have known Shushani and the people who have not known Shushani. So in a way, that afternoon in Berlin in 2010, I felt like this was true also, not just for people who had met Shushani firsthand, but it was also true that there were people who knew what Professor Kosman was talking about, and then there were people who were clueless. I remember another a student of his, another woman, and we exchanged a glance. I remember that as a very special moment of like feeling aware of a secret that not many people were, and I went and exchanged a few words with him about my work and my research, and um, I remember him telling me about the two stories about Shushani, the one about eating uh, almost car only carrots, and the one about Shushani jumping out of the window, uh, which he just mentioned. So I remember that in my own personal story of Shushani that I was so slowly putting together into a play, um, I imagined Shushani really jumping out from this window and leaving uh, Europe and Israel forever, only to reappear um, in uh, Montevideo in Uruguay. And I started wondering why, what was it that he was looking for there? And I made up my own theory, which was then confirmed in part. Um, I just felt like Shushani was too big for um, a place as small as, as Europe or Israel, and that he, ne he needed to be in a much larger space. So I felt like you know, the wilderness of South America was probably a better place where someone could be the um, exactly what Professor Kosman was talking about before, this idea of anava and sniut, of modesty and make oneself humble and small. So I very much connected to the, this idea of like needing to leave the very small and narrow Europe to in a way disappear or ma make oneself smaller in a larger, larger space. Um, so with those elements, I really started creating a play. So by now, this was uh, the winter of 2014. Um, and it was uh, about time to put something out. Uh, so in the very few minutes that we have, uh, I want to share just a very tiny clip from uh, the first show that I did that winter. Um, and then I will tell you one last thing about a second work that I did on it. So 
Now I just want to share um, this gun. I had it ready here. Uh, it is also on uh, uh, Michael Greenspan's uh, um, website on uh, shushani.com that Michael Greenspan, the director, was doing his film on Shushani. So he put it there very early on. Miriam, I don't think that we're hearing the sound. Huh. Daron, can you help with this? Okay, let me... okay. I think I think I can. I think I I got it. send the link. I'm sorry about not sharing the sound earlier. I hope you could hear the second part of it. Not if you did. Yes. Okay. So um, again, it's a long play. It's more than one hour long. At this stage, it was a monologue. It was just me on stage. Um, for those of you uh, who could recognize what I was uh, chanting at the beginning, it was a passage from Pirkei Avot, from the Mishnah. Uh, with the Italian trope, because that's the one that uh, resonates in me. Um, and it is a very famous passage that um, talks about the 10, which then become 14 extraordinary things that are created by the Almighty right before Shabbat, which is also, again, the name um, of my theater company, Ben Mashot, in this time of the day in which it's, it's like now, actually, <laughs> at least in Italy, um, in between day and night. Um, and the, I guess there were many reasons that made me associate Shushani with, uh, with that uh, Mishnah, but mostly uh, the whole idea of the exception to the rule of something that was at the same time very, in, very much into 
life and very much exceptional. Um, and also this little passage of Kvurato uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, of uh, um, the burial place of uh, uh, Moses, which we don't know. So there was all this mystery around Shushani's death and burial uh, and name in general that made me think of that Mishnah. Uh, and I just want to jump ahead because I will have to close my presentation in really a couple of minutes, I think. So I just want to share with you all that the play had a second uh, re-elaboration and uh, rework, uh, which I did um, not much later. And in that case, also, my search for a master, which was the, the very title of my play on Shushani, actually came to an accomplishment with me finding an actor I very much wanted to work with. It's an Italian um, half-Jewish actor uh, whose name is Ruggero Dondi. And um, I guess I will just show you a picture of, of uh, our play um, because that's the easiest thing I can do right now. Um, so it was... Um, just a few months later that I got to uh, work with, uh, with Ruggiero on, um, on our second version of the Shushani play. This is him. Um, and uh, we did this, uh, this show in uh, a monastery. It premiered in a monastery in Tuscany, in Kamaldoli. So I was giggling a little when I heard about uh, Shushani's interpretations uh, of Jesus, in a way. Um, because there, what we did, again, it was in an interfaith, um, interreligious conference that I participate to every year in Kamaldoli. Um, so that year, the whole conference was dedicated to Jesus. Um, and I had my play on Shushani ready. So it was just, I mean, there are no co coincidences, as, as we know. Zufall is a treif wort, but still, we, we, that's where we ended up doing it. Um, and what we did there, uh, Ruggiero Dondi and I, was we played with another rabbinic story. In this case, it was the very, very famous Haggadah from, um, from the Talmud in uh, Chagiga, page 14b, which is uh, the one about the Arbaash and Ichmesula Pardes, the four masters who entered the Pardes, this place of mystical contemplation. Um, and there we worked very much on the character of Acher, of Elisha ben Abuya, one of the heretics of the Talmud, maybe the most famous heretic figure. Um, and of course, we were not, chas v'chalila, God forbid, associating or comparing uh, Shushani to uh, Apikoires, to an heretical, but we were very much working with the idea of the other, of Acher, of the the one who is eternally wandering also with our place of, uh, of rest. And... Uh, um, we there um, focused most of our work on uh, the period of Shushani going into the um, houses for of the orphanages or the houses in France in Taverny and uh, so on, where, for example, Elie Wiesel met Shushani. So the place um, where we had Elisha Ben Abuya and Shushani met was this idea when uh, when uh, Elisha Ben Abuya when Acher goes and in interrogates and asks children about God's justice, basically. There is a passage after he has bec bec become a hair where he goes and asks uh, children what they are studying. And there is always something in what the children uh, ask, uh, answer to him that says basically that there is redemption and tshuva for everyone, but not for him. Um, and so we worked very much with, again, with this idea of God's justice and of Shushani basically walking from one place to another where children who had been confronted, teenagers, not just children, who had been confronted with the, uh, the biggest manifestation of the problem of God's justice and God's absence during the Shoah and uh, being with them there, just the fact of being there, of teaching the book that deals with it, which is Yov and uh, Job. So again, there is no time and this is not the right place to talk about a whole play, but I just wanted to give you a taste of these two versions of a work, which is potentially infinite and uh, ever changing and happening. Um, but more or less, these are the two, um, the two works that I wanted to present. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam. We have a few minutes, really just a handful of minutes. If anybody has any questions they want to uh, type into the chat. Uh, unfortunately, I got a message from uh, David that due to a uh, personal emergency, he had to uh, he had to leave our Zoom. 
uh, he's just fine, but uh, but something came up uh, family related, um, um, and uh, and so I see that we have a handful of questions. Uh, one um, uh, one uh, um, from Sandrine, which is a wonderful question. We should also point out that uh, Sandrine just published a book in French on uh, on. Uh, uh, Shoshani, and she, along with several other speakers, will be speaking tomorrow at a parallel event uh, like this one in French for a French-speaking audience. Um, and she asks a wonderful question, which is about the audience for these notebooks. Do you agree that the idea that Shoshani's notebooks were not intended for others, but were only notes intended for him, hence the difficulty of deciphering his personal notes? Uh, before I turn the microphone over to our panelists to speak, I'll say a sentence and a half in the name of uh, Dr. Lang, since I've discussed this with him at length. Um, uh, Dr. Lang is convinced that uh, Shoshani was was writing for us to read, uh, and he had us in mind, um, but uh, but that he certainly expected us to work and not merely for him to to spoon feed us as it will uh, his his thought. Um, I'm not a hundred percent convinced by that. Uh, I'm not sure that there was any intended audience at all, uh, but I would be curious to uh, to hear what either uh, uh, Admiel or Miriam have to suggest on that. May I say, uh, I tell you a story that uh, Michael Grinspan told me that uh, from time to time a student, uh, for example, a student that told him the story that he wanted to uh, fly to Israel and then he said to him, because he wanted him to come back, if you come back, I'll show you what I wrote in the booklet. So uh, that was like a prize for those who were uh, really excellent students and he wanted to show it to them. So it was not really only a secret booklet that nobody uh, from his side would ever uh, uh, take a look in it. I think that it's not a, it is so, I think even in cases that are hidden, uh, you know, hidden secret uh, text, everybody that writes everything unconsciously know that after his death, somebody will open it, yes? And so it is hardly the case that it was something that was meant to be hidden from anybody in the world. Uh, it is Torah, and as Torah, he wanted the people to, to study it later. I'm sure about it. May, may I say one more sentence about yes, it? Yes, go ahead, of course. Chance? Because uh, the sh a short time, I, uh, I, I left uh, the people who heard me with no uh, point in the end that it is important for me that fulfill this, to fill this gap in the end. So what is the connection between the universal and the particular in the end? My assumption, and I told you that I think that this is what he read in Moreno Vuchim of, the, of Maimonides, the guide of the perplex. The Torah is a way for the common people to come closer to God, surely. Uh, but but uh, Maimonides uh, uh, could admit that there are exceptions like Aristotle for him that could reach the divine level without uh, being Israel in the regular style and fulfilling the mitzvot. So for him, the way to God is open to everybody. He was universalist as, as Maimonides was, not like the Kuzari, not like Rabbi Yudha Levi that uh, is now the leader of the education in Israel and maybe all over the world in the Jewish uh, uh, particular way. For him, Universalism means the way for everybody in any religion all over the world is open to God. But the point here, when you come to equanimity, when you are able to come to canceling your ego, and namely it's a grace, but you are working on it, as we said, act actively and passively together, waiting for the grace and being able to, to go through the whole experiences in life, like Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, you are able to come to be devoted to God in such a way that there's no, when you come to this point, there's no difference between Jews and non-Jews or those who are fulfilling the system of the mitzvot or not because they are there. Whatever they do is mitzvah. Let's say, put it simply. Because when there is no ego, there is only mitzvah in your life. You are not doing, you are done. You find yourself doing without uh, intending. You do the goodness. Whatever you do is the goodness. 
But those who are not on that level, tzaddik sheno gamur, as I started to explain, those who need to be still working on their egocentrism, they are in a, a very, uh, I would say, dire state that they need, dire state that they need this mitzvot without that they cannot come closer to, to God. And the Jews or non-Jews are in the same uh, situation. They need directions. And that, that's, I think, almost sure. I, that, that's what Shoshani would tell you if you would be with us here. And that's also the answer to the, the question of the booklet. These pearls, diamonds, are in the booklet. So how can you say that he did not want us to understand it? Of course he wanted us to, to, to study his Torah and even, I would say, to spread this Torah, especially in this generation. That's, it's not maybe for vain that in our generation it comes out. We need it. That's the point I want to say. Thank you. Um, so we're going to uh, end our event at this point. Um, and I want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining, uh, everybody who listened uh, from at home uh, and online, particularly again to, uh, to Doron uh, behind the scenes, to Dr. Yael Levy for her work putting together the panel. Um, and of course, to our speakers, Dr. David Lang, Professor Adil Kosman and Miriam Camarini. And again, uh, please continue to attend uh, online events in English, Hebrew, and other languages sponsored by the National Library of Israel. Thank you so much.